like we were saying last night, he gave us a blueprint for this conference. Um, but he had shifted this entire thing. And what I understand now is that coming into this atmosphere today, God, like someone said last night, God has sent us here, y'all, to go back out. He sent us here to go back out. That this conference should boost our confidence and our boldness in Jesus to, to literally do what he's called for us to do. Can we do that in hours? That's, that's literally what we need to be doing. 
And God gave me a word earlier this year. He said, he gave me the word equip. He said, I'm calling my children to begin to equip the body of Christ. Or to go out, right? This is why the Lord said that, that the harvest is plenty, right? But the laborers are few. Are we working? Are we asking the Lord, use me? I pray that you would send me out. People want Jesus. And it's as simple as walking into Walmart. That's the days I walk into Walmart. I'm like, Lord, just highlight somebody to me. And some people, they get scared. Like, I don't know how to share the gospel. It's like, well, what, what are you doing? Because with the day that we say yes to Jesus, is the day that we, it's like a contract, a covenant saying, I'm going to go out. Yeah. Right? Yes. yes. And so, can you share the gospel of Jesus? Can you pray for someone? Can you say, I'm going to go out to the store, but God highlights someone to me that you need for me to talk to. That's it. That's all. That's Jesus. And so, he has started me in Psalm 118, verse 22. And it says that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And then he took me over to Luke uh, chapter 20, verse 9 through 17. And this is the parable of the vineyard uh, owner. I'm going to read that because it's so good. And I really want us to hone in on what this parable is saying. It's Luke chapter set, uh, 20, starting at verse 9. Luke 20, verse 9. It says, I'm reading from the um, CSB version. It says, Now he began to tell people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, leased it to the tenant farmers, and went away for a long time. In harvest time, he sent a servant to the farmers so that they might give him some fruit from the vineyard. But the farmers beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but they beat that one too, treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third but they wounded this one too and threw him out. Verse 13 says, Then the owner of the vineyard said, What should I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they would respect him. But when the tenant farmers saw him, they discussed it among themselves and said, This is his hair. Let's kill him. So that the inheritance will be ours. Verse 15. So they threw him out of the vineyard and yelled and killed him. Excuse me. What then would the owner of the vineyard do to them? He would come and kill those farmers and give the vineyard to others. But when they heard this, they said, that must never happen. But he looked at them and said, then what is the meaning of this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 18, everyone who follows that stone will be broken to pieces. On whomever it falls, it will shatter him. Then the scribes and the chief priests looked for a way to get their hands on him that very hour. Because they knew he had told his parable against them, but they feared the people. Yeah. My Lord. And so just to kind of give a little, you know, context and break it down a little bit. We know that the owner of the vineyard is God. And the vineyard is Israel, right? Or in other words, husband and farmers. Us, okay? So now we're talking about the believers. And it says that he, that he sent his servants, right? So that means that he sent his prophets. He sent his priests of, of God. His people, his, you know, the, the mouthpieces. Those he's going to use. To come in and begin to tell them about uh, building fruit, bearing fruit. Right? Because when we're looking at this scripture, one of the things that I want to hone in on is Isaiah 5. All this kind of connects together. It talks about the vineyard. It says, like, even in the Old Testament, it talks about how they, you know, went out and they were trying to really like, make a call for people to bear good fruit. What are you doing with the fruits? What are you doing with what God gives you? But even Isaiah coming into the New Testament, it shows how they wasn't bearing anything, <laughs> it was bitter. It's like, what are you doing? It's a believer of Jesus, right? And so it says, not one, not two, but three, he sent his prophets. He sent his, his people to call out. That's what he's done. That's what he's done with us. Yeah. 
We see ourselves like saying, God, like this stuff of this Greek life stuff is not of God. What are we doing? It's not something we just wake up and we just wanted to do. This stuff was hard. And they rejected each and every person that God sent. Just like us, right? They reject us. They mock us. <laughs> and so then it's like, after all that happened, God said, okay, I just sent my people, my people, they killed them, they mocked them, he said, they're angry, he said, I'm going to give them another chance. And he sent his son, Jesus. He sent his son, Jesus. And it says, in the scripture we see, where it talks about how they killed him off. Okay, they killed him off. And so one of the things is we're talking about the fruit here, y'all. One of the things God is saying is like, we have to begin to bear the fruit. The people, they bear fruit once again, but the fruit was bad. And so that's what we're seeing in the body of Christ. We're seeing so many people say, I'm a believer. I'm, I, I believe in God. I go to church. It's like, where's the fruit? What are you doing? It's not enough to say that no longer. It is our, is what the Lord is saying. This is why the Bible says in Matthew 7 20, by their fruits ye shall show me, or know me, excuse me. So in other words, we must examine our own fruit by looking at how we treat others, right? Both, both in word and in action. So we have to examine ourselves. Even when we're talking about these organizations, you know, of course, there's a lot of people that's in the church and pastors and all these things in these organizations. And some, and some people, it's like, well, when you really look at your life, though, who have you brought to Christ in these things? Who have you shared Jesus with? Who got saved through you in this organization? And I remember last year, I was in the shower, and I was like, and I hear the Lord a lot of times in the shower, and I just began to like cry, and I was like, God, as long as I've been a Christian, because we honest with ourselves. I was, I was talking to him about this morning. We honest with ourselves, y'all. That was a point where like, I'm like, Lord, I really was not a Christian. <laughs> if I'm looking at the Bible, if I'm, if I, uh, come on, right? I really know I wasn't. And so I said, Lord, I said, how many people have I brought to Christ that I've been a Christian? Because we have this thing, oh, I've been in church, and I'm, since I've been born, you know, this whole thing saved, like, me and Taylor talking about since we were young. It's like, but who have I brought to Christ? And so I remember asking the Lord that, and one of the things that he said was, I'm about to use you to bring them back to me through this. <laughs> and so we came here thinking, I mean, to me too, thinking <laughs> that we're going to be helping. But it's, but it's like, a, it's almost like this when someone said marching orders. Yep. My Lord. God is so intentional. So I'm, I'm just putting some here tonight. You think we're going to go ahead and for you. Don't go back out thinking I'm about to be silent. You came into the right place. So we don't hold you accountable. Amen. And so back to the text. So now we know we're in the New Testament. And the children, it's like the children of Israel, they were, they were listening. Because once again, we see in Isaiah where... They were talking about the same thing, you know, bear fruit, come out and come here of these, you know, idolatry and all these things, whatever. So in the New Testament, they're listening. The children of Israel, they listen, they hear what's being said. It was familiar to them. Right? So we're honest with ourselves when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to the word. There's things in the word that we've heard before. It's familiar to us. We may not understand it, but it's familiar. Right? Even with these Greek things, like, it's familiar because you've heard, everyone has heard the time this thing is not of him. Yep. It was familiar to what they were hearing, but they were still not saying yes to God. They were still not producing fruit. So they were, it was worthless. And so in scripture, in verse 10, it says, at harvest time, when he sent his servants out, I want to kind of hone in. I love being like, you know, definitions of things. And so, when it says the time of harvest, time of harvest means a season of a thing. It means kairos or kairos. Do measure. Measure of time is a portion. A fixed or definite time. 
when things are brought to a crisis, excuse me, it's an opportune or a seasonable time, the right time, right? So even when people are talking about, you know, well, why yeah, this thing has to be quiet, and, you know, this whole thing, and like, why I keep, you know, but God is saying it's the hardest time. This is the right time. I'm snatching my children out. Because a part of this text, y'all, he's talking about covenant. He was talking about covenant. He said, snatch my children out so they can come back and covenant with me. Right? That's really what we're talking about. It's only through, yes, you can probably do a little bit of something, you know, while you're in these three organizations. You can see, you can do certain things, right? But it's only so far you're going to go and you're going to stop. Because you're not in covenant with the true and living God. And so, this is what we see. And we're talking about believers. I'm not even talking about unbelievers. We're talking about believers right now. That you are in covenant with something else of the world. Yeah. And you wonder why you're struggling. You're wondering why you're going through all these mental battles of certain things. Because there's an open door to your life. So yeah, you can do a little bit of something. You can shout and do things. But you're only going to go so far before they think crash. And if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of us that have come out of these things, it's like, at some point in your life, part of some a time or season, there was a point in your life where you really wanted more from God. It's like, God, I want more. But well, what is it? I know I've been through that. I'm like, I know I want, I know there's more to me as a believer of Christ, but what is it? And if we're honest with ourselves, we have to seek the Lord, y'all. It's that simple. The word is so simple. My Lord. It's so simple. And so the time of harvest is where God is doing something in the earth. Yes. He's doing something. It's a harvest time for God, for his people to come to him truly. And so the harvest time symbolizes Jesus being up to something. He's trying to do something in the earth through his people, through his vessels. And so not only were they not producing, but the scripture says that as he starts sending out his prophets and his and testimonies, all these things like God is not, you hear it, you see it, you know it, and you're still rejecting me. And a lot of times, you know, we, it's, I mean, not even somebody, not to be anything, y'all. When God brings someone into your life, you keep hearing the same thing over and over again. Oh, that's not me, that's not my condition, that's not how I feel, that's not my interpretation. God is saying, what does the word say? That's all we have to do. Jesus is the cornerstone. And so what we're saying tonight, even with all of us that talk about Jesus at some point of the, of the Bible, it sounds familiar to us. You've heard testimonies over and over again. But God is saying, seek me though. Not even give us salt me. And it's so wild when I think about this passage, I'm thinking about how God is so patient. He's so patient. He sent people over and over and over and over and over again. But God says, one of the things I was studying is he said, but my patience is running out. I planned this conference, you know, when it comes to this particular topic, that's always been like a, I don't know, with me. Like, God has truly broke me down. This has been, you know, playing a conference, but it has really broke me. It has shifted my heart so much. I have not cried. <laughs> and I was, I tell people a lot of times, I'm not really a crier. I say it, but it's like, girl, maybe you are, because I have cried a lot. You know, playing this conference, um, there were just days, y'all, you know, and that's why I say this stuff is, is, I don't take it lightly, because not only am I having to go to the Lord about this, right, and have a bear the persecution, the backlash is out there, but I have a husband, I have children, that I'm having to war for and cover as well, so it's like, I don't take it lightly. My marriage, all that thing, so it's like, when I speak out, I know what I'm walking into. And that's what the Lord is saying, that some of us have had fear. You've had fear. And so I have cried. I don't know. It's, it's, I, it's like, God, what is happening? He is breaking me. I didn't know I needed 
this, I need this. Even last night, I needed that, y'all. Like, I am, I say I'm not a cry, but I, you know, like many of us grow up in a church in our, in our homes and things like that. We come from homes that may not have shown vulnerability or, you know, certain things. And so that's why I need to tough it up. So I don't know how I don't know how to be a cry. So you see me cry, it's like, man, like God is breaking me. <laughs> it's a shift. And I'm I'm receiving it. I love it. And so we see this happening in the scriptures. God has sent his people. And verse 14 through 16, I'm going to read it again. It says, But when the tenant farmers saw him, they discussed it among themselves, and he said, This is the hair. Let's kill him so that the inheritance would be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And we see, you know, going for they, you know, decided to reject him. And so when I was looking at this, the Lord says that people really think that they're like benefiting more in the world. They're benefiting more when they even reject your testimony, right? Because they have this this thinking of like, you know, what they've gained, you know, through these things and the world and, you know, whatever it is they've gained, right? But they failed to realize, I think Jonathan said, said it, that the children, the children of Israel, they were in rebellion against God. So it's like, even when you're sharing your testimony, even when you're doing all these things, you, they're rebelling against God. All these Facebook posts that we see and we read, it's like, we know it's about us. <laughs> they're rebelling against God. Don't even understand that. They were rebelling against God. They broke covenant with God. The children of Israel rejected Jesus and his testimony, even what he came here to do, right? So God is just saying, you know, this is why they are going to reject us, because they rejected Jesus. The children of Israel, they were willing to entertain the possibility that they had been unfaithful to God and rejected his son. It's like they were willing to entertain. It's like, you know, when you think about this Greek stuff, when you think about anything, people living in the world, it's like they are willing to be unfaithful. They're willing to try it. They're willing to see how far they can go. Right? Like me and us, before we came out, it's like we were willing to say, you know what, I don't, I don't really know. You know, and that's why we come into this mindset. It's not my conviction. I don't. I don't see it. I mean, I'm, I'm living life, and we measure things by how success. I think Melissa said this. We measure things by well, I'm doing well. I'm making money. I'm doing all these things, right? But Jesus is a cornerstone. Are we measuring things by the word, even our personal life? Because if we're honest. And I keep reference to people because I've had conversations. But, and I, two people I talked to about this, but it was actually, it was uh, Taylor, but one of you guys had said something that was so similar. It was like, if we, we have to measure things by this, not just this, this denouncement stuff, but in everything. Right? Because even us, we're still going to deliverance. We still need to be saved from things. You know what I'm saying? So we just cannot just, yes, we're holding out this is a time and a season, but God says that everything, don't, don't become boastful, don't become prideful. Still measure things by Jesus, the word of God. Because we're still going through. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. My Lord. And so, Jesus made it clear to Israel that their rejection of his son is a rejection of God, which is a fulfillment of the scriptures. We see it. And this is why we must remember that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That's John 14 16. The leaders scorned Jesus and persecuted him, which is per which is a perfect reminder that as children of God, like I said before, we will be persecuted. But this is a great thing, y'all. Remember this, that when God has called you to do something, no matter what your assignment is, 2 Timothy 3, 12 says, in fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ, not the world. In Christ, y'all. That's why I said, do we really, I'm like, do we really understand the cross? Do we really understand it? Because this is why when he's telling us, 
to seek him and his righteousness and all things be added to him. That's saying that you keep me first. <laughs> do what I tell you to do. Live for me. It's this your job, your money. That's just an So that means that even if I don't have these things, I'm still going to live for Jesus. Because there's some things I'm trying to get to. This is why Paul said in the scriptures, he said to, live, to die is the game. Yes. <laughs> to die is the game. Matthew 5.10 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's what we're fighting for. Jesus, that's what we're fighting for. So we must remember that when we are out here, we're you know, living for Christ. And God is sending us into these spaces and these environments and things like that. That even when enemies come against us and people come against us, what does the Bible say? Matthew 5 and 44 said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Yeah. It is a humbling thing, y'all, when you deal with persecution. Like, I mean, it's... I don't think I pray for my enemies this much. <laughs> I honestly, but I used to live in a very naive world, you know, about having enemies, honestly. I did. You know, people say, like, oh, keep your enemies closer or something like that. And I'm like, that is stupid. Like, what? I don't want to have any enemies. And um, I, I'm a person that I don't like confrontation. I don't like, I just, I, I don't like it, right? And so one of the things that the Lord has really been dealing with me is how to deal with confrontation as a, as a believer in Jesus. I'm a person like, they used to just make me so uncomfortable. But I think that's what we see in the body of Christ. We don't like to see people uncomfortable, right? It's like, I don't I know the truth, I want to tell I don't get uncomfortable. That's what we see in the world now, right? Everything is issues of senses to people. But the gospel is a it's offensive. So can you even find yourself in your workplace and your where you are, even in church, and say some things that the Lord tells you to say? This is why the word the Lord gave me a prophetic word last year, I believe, it was, almost two years ago, maybe. And I kept hearing the word system disruptors. And I'm like, Lord, what is it? What is it? I'm gonna be using terms like that. What does it mean? I know it's Lord. But he was saying, I'm calling my children into these spaces and these environments to begin to shake it up. Your workspaces, all these things are trying to become, you know, open and equal, whatever, you know. Um, he was just saying, I'm sending my children to go into these spaces. He said, I'm going to make a way for them. I'm going to make a way for you. All you do is just submit to the Lord. And he'll take care of everything else. There has been so much peace, y'all. Like, when you really humble yourself, you back away, you allow for the, for the Lord to fight for you. Yes. I've seen it. I was crying in there, like, Lord, thank you so much. I've seen the evidence of what you're doing yes. with this conference, with everything he's done. I've seen the evidence. I've seen the evidence of what the Lord has done. I've seen him fight for me. Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the cornerstone. He wants us to know, God wants us to know that Jesus is the most important stone. What does this mean? That Jesus is the cornerstone. That means, y'all, that he is the foundation. That means that he's the light. That means that he's our guide. That means that he's Jesus is solid. That means that he is the basis for determining every measurement in construction. He is the standard of measure. Yes. Come on. I thought that was so good. My God, it's like he's the standard. It's like he's a measure. He's a measure stick. It's like so that means everything that we do, Jesus, what are you saying? What what are you saying? Not how I feel, not what I think. But he's the measure. That means that in everything that we do, we should be measured by the word of the Lord. Not by how I feel, not my pastor feel. Not, no, it's the word. And that, that just saved us so much, y'all. Just open up this word. 
It's that simple. But we become so consumed with the world, conforming to it. It's like me, my mom's got a job, and I'm rich, and I this and that. Oh, God is good. No, that's not like what that means. Because if anything, he'll probably tell you to get away. Can you be broke and still live for Jesus? Oh, right? Now, of course, he wants to live in a bunch of life because he wants to live out your hand like that. But what I'm saying is, when you find yourself struggling enough, or whatever you're going through in life, can Jesus still be the standard? Last thing I have here is Matthew 6, verse 3, when it says, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. When it comes to that word, seek. Because this is what the Lord was telling me. I'm going to give you just an example. Um, about a month ago, I think I shared this on Facebook. Uh, I was on a fast back in February. And I remember, and this is, and this is how God says, this is, this is how I want my children to just seek me. I was on a fast. And I posed, I, I, I asked God this question. I just said, God, it's very simple. And I was listening to a video. And it was very simple. I said, God, if there's anything in my home that is unholy, that's a, you know, that's defiled me, that is that goes against you, Lord, show it to me. And in a second, I got a vision of a book that was on our shelf. And I saw the name of the book, I saw the colors of the book, because he talks to me sometimes with visions. And I saw it clear as day. And I was like, hey, that's my book, book. That's my book. That's my book. That's my book. That's my book. And so I was going to ignore it. But the video I was listening to, I mean, immediately when I came out of the vision, the girl in the video said, and that book is not a God. I was like, ah, ooh. And so well, that's how God works. He's trying to get our attention, right? When you have an open heart, when you seek the Lord, he's going to pour into you. He's going to reveal to you. That's literally, that's all it is. And so I go to the book and everything, and I'm looking in the book, and I, you know, get on Google and everything, and I'm like, hey, you see this book? What book? What the book is this book? You know, no, no. I'm like, bro, we're going to do some research. <laughs> and we did, and it was clear as day. Just didn't know how to get ready. It was there, so, you know, we could fall instantly. But that's the word said, that's how I want you to seek me. Yeah. All you got to do is ask me. Yeah. It, all you got to do is ask me. That's how he wants us to seek him. That's how he wants to come to his word. That's all you got to do is say, God, is this of you or not? And just like in Melissa's testimony, how God replayed everything that God would do that, it's the very same thing for us. Yes. Even when we're talking about this organization, we might, if we're not even talking about the Bible, right? You said that you did things by pledging, by hating haze. You belittled, your, belittled yourself. You did all these things. That was just not right to be a co profit organization. It's like, just be real. Let's just be honest for a second. Let's just tell the truth. God's a God of truth. He's not a God of confusion. He's not. It's like, this is deception. It's blindness. And that is literally how the enemy want us to walk around. Oh, well, like, I didn't you know, only because it's, it's like he just, it, he's so cunning. Yeah. Yep. My Lord, and that's who you should be mad at. Yeah. <laughs> that's who you should be mad at. Because now when you come to the knowledge of these things, now I have to fight for my children to see your place. I have to fight for my marriage. Yes. I have to fight for my bloodline. Yeah. And I thank God that when I came out of Delta, our son at the time was uh, 12 months, he was one. And God used my son to open up my eyes. I remember when I was going through that whole thing, and I'm like, God, why is it? And I remember I was feeding my son. I tell this to him all the time because it makes me so, it just I just, I just always break down. And I'm sitting there, I'm feeding our son. And in a moment, like our son begins to cry, you know, do what babies do and things like that. And I took something away from him. And as I'm taking away from him, he's just pouting and shouting, you know. But God said, this is you, though. He said, all you see is I'm trying to take something away from you, but you don't know what I'm trying to give to you. 
Because in that moment, I was taking something from our son. God got to give him a banana. His baby was like, who got to you know? Hell no. And God said, this is you. This is why God would use children, yeah. the most innocent ones, to get our attention. Yeah. That's what he did. And I just began to break. And in that moment, I knew I had to say yes. Because now I'm coming to the knowledge of things. I'm like, Lord, I don't, I don't dare want my children to join this stuff. For them to act like, you know, to make them prove themselves, their identity in Christ and things like that. I would dare put my, I would dare hand over my children. Because that's what a lot of parents have done in these things. They've handed over legacy and trying to carry all these things out. And don't realize that they're messing up. And see, the devil, we know the devil is very funny. He will say, okay, I'll let this generation pass and be successful and do all of these things. I let the second one pass and all these things. So he'll just get you thinking that, like, I'm successful. Oh, it's my harm. But the third and fourth generation come, they start to struggle. And things start to happen. You don't know why it came from. That's just like any disease. It starts with a headache. Right? And you don't pay attention. Oh, it's okay. I'm taking some ibuprofen. But then other areas in your body start to decay or you, you know, go bad. And you don't know where it came from. But the body of Christ, we have the spirit of the Lord in us. Jesus, the cornerstone, to take the to the stand in your measure. All we have to do is open up and say, God, what is this? God, show me where did this come from? Mm. So the word seek is we're seeking, we're searching to find something. You're craving for it. Like, God, I want to know, is this true or is it not? You pray for it. You acquire it. You be intentional about it. You demand, God, I want to know. If what they're saying is true or not, God, I want to know. I'm putting a demand on it. Because that shows how much do I really love God. When I hear something that's not of you, God, I want to know. Because I love you. I want to please you. I want to live righteously for you. And so God says, do you want to know the truth, says the Lord? Seek me. And even in this seeking, we're talking about spiritual things. It's not just materialistic stuff. It's not just, you know, blessings. It's like spiritual things, true wisdom. Now, this is how the verse says in Proverbs. He says, I will pour out my spirit upon you and teach you my word. He'll teach us. He'll show us, y'all. Jesus says, I am the cornerstone. I am the standard. I died for you. So you wouldn't have to take the beating. Your identity is in me, says the Lord, not the world, not your organization, in me. Matthew 22, 37, I'm about to end out. Through 40 says, love the Lord, your God, with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. This is the greatest and most important command. And the second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. Even in this, I have to, I have to the Lord had to shift my heart. Because I used to be a person like, oh, I, I just don't understand. Like, why? And not just this stuff, but just that's just who I was a lot of times when it came to God. Like, God, I just don't understand. Like, why? You know? And. When I read that last part as a prophet, he says, all the law and the prophets depend on these two. We're talking about love. Yes. And so, this is what the Lord wants. He wants us to begin to measure things by Him. That's all you gotta do. Jesus as the cornerstone. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you, God, that this word has gone forth. Thank you, God, for your vessels. Thank you, Father, for what you are doing in this hour. Thank you, God, that we came in one way, God, and we're not going to leave the same. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for shifting our hearts. Thank you, God, for your word says that the harvest is out there. It's out there, God. But make us laborers. Father, your word tells us for us to pray for laborers. So, Father, today, I pray, oh God, that we will make the decision to labor, to work. This is why the Bible said that Jesus, he looked out into the multitude, into the crowd, and he saw that his children, they were dejected, they were scattered. God, make us laborers. Let us not love our life, oh God. Let us love you more, Father. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that we're seeing the evidence of what it is that you're doing. Fill us up with your spirit, oh God. Fill us up with your spirit. Fill us up with your knowledge and your wisdom. Let us measure things by your word, God, for you are the standard. Thank you, Jesus. Let your will be done, oh God, in our lives. Let us put down things, oh God, that is not of you. Let us just ask you, oh God, and may you reveal to us, oh God, even the mystery, the hidden things, Father, that's in your word. Even the things that you that may not even be in your word, but you are a God that you can reveal even mysteries of a thing. Pour out your spirit upon us, oh God. Give us spiritual wisdom and revelation, God. Put your power into our inner beings. May we walk in authority, Father. May we walk in the power, Father, that you have given us. And at the end of the day, let us not be boastful. Let us not be prideful. But let us put all the glory back to you, Father, on your throne. Let us lay at the feet of Jesus, like Mary. I even hear the Lord say, come back to my feet. Don't be like Martha. Sit at my feet. Position yourselves at my feet, says the Lord. That when I call you on assignment, says the Lord, come back to my feet. Come back to the secret place, says the Lord. Jesus. It's like I see his feet right now. It's like our, just a face just sitting at his feet. Get back into your secret place, says the Lord. Worship me, says the Lord. I keep hearing the word worship right now. Worship me, says the Lord. Sit at my feet, says the Lord. Intimacy, says the Lord. Stay connected to, uh, connected to me, says the Lord.
on earth as it is in heaven. Let us surrender to you, God. Surrender at your feet. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, baby. 